Um, Rob Enker is a composer, artist, and software developer, mainly known for his contributions to electronic music and for his laser works. His audiovisual installations are based on self-written software and explore a fragile balance between determination and chance operations to create complex behaviors and endless variations in expression. His musical work oscillates between ambient, contemporary music, and the club. His long-term project, Monolake, became one of the key icons of new electronic club culture emerging in Berlin after the fall of the wall. He is one of the main creators of Ableton Live, a software which became the standard for music production and completely redefined performance of electronic music. That's not uh, <laughs> underestimation. Uh, he writes and lectures about the creative use of computers and um, held teaching positions at uh, CCRMA Stanford. When you say karma, don't you? At URCAM, um, the Studio National des Arts Contemporaines um, in Lille, France. His works have been presented at Tate Modern in London, um, Paris, Rome, New York, Luxembourg, Vienna, Venice, Australia, Eindhoven, and at countless festivals, including uh, Unsigned CTM, Mutex, Sonar, New Forms Festival. Um, yeah, and on a personal note, I'm really pleased um, that you've taken time out of your very busy schedule um, to join us, Robert, um, also as a former student, kind of, of yours in Berlin at the um, Sound Studies um, MA at the UDK in Berlin, which is now called Sound Studies and Sonic Arts, I believe. They've renamed it since then. Um, yeah, so I'll hand over to you and um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Annie, for the lovely introduction. Um, it's great fun to be here. Uh, I thought about what I could talk about and I decided to stay a bit monochromatic, focused on the last thing that I did. And uh, instead of showing you my talking head, I try to provide a slideshow. Uh, let's see if that works. And um, I need to share my screen. And that should work in a second. It did before. So share content, share application, entire screen, allow. So um, you should get this nice video feedback now. If so, then everything is cool. And I switch over to Keynote and here we go. So the, the unofficial title of my, my talk today is doing something that seems utterly useless, but insisting in its significance. Uh, that seems to be the core of artistic expression in many ways. And uh, I will come back later to what this means for me personal or maybe even general. Um, in 2016, I came across a Commodore CBM 8032 computer in a bar in Athens. And I was pretty fascinated by this computer because I recognized it as the type of computer I used to learn programming with at school uh, some almost 40 years ago. And I asked if I can turn it on and the owner said, yeah, sure, it runs. And I had this really, really interesting, nostalgic moment there. And I was strongly impressed by the graphics I saw there. This uh, interesting glow of fluorescent green on a cathode ray tube. That is something which once was the future and now it's obsolete technology. And when I came back home from Athens, I just looked on eBay for one of those machines and I found one. And this was the beginning of a journey that put me um, to where I am now, performing concerts with five of those machines and developing my own hardware to extend what they can do. So my talk is a little bit about this gray area between engineering on one side and artistic creation on the other side and what these things have to do with each other uh, especially in regards to sound. So what I started developing turned out to become this concert for 
five of those machines on stage. So that's a, a photo here from an actual stage setup. And it was not planned from the beginning that it ended up like this. This is a result of a process. At the beginning, I just bought one of those machines and tried to figure out what can I do. And this is important in retrospective because uh, as we will see later, there is a difference between when you start an artistic project uh, and what might be the outcome. So what is the fascination for this project? Uh, for me, the fascination came from the fact that I'm using obsolete technology and everything I present at my uh, concerts there basically could have been done in 1980 already. And um, that the reason why I do it and find it interesting is that the results I achieve with it probably would not have been done in 1980 because they would have been discarded as not interesting. And suddenly, uh, 40 years later, we can look at an aesthetic or can look at a piece of technology just as we look at a musical instrument and come up with something that is different simply because you have a different mindset. And that was the starting point of my explorations. I wanted to figure out what can I do with those computers that feel contemporary. And that was the beginning. Uh, a few words about these computers because uh, they are somehow iconic. And that of course helps when trying to use them in an artistic context. Uh, basically the grandfather of the machines I'm using is this one, uh, which has been featured in countless uh, movies and everything because it looks so kind of prototype computer wise. Uh, and it is based on a 6502 microprocessor. And there is something that is interesting about this CPU. It was the first CPU that was affordable. And culturally, this is significant because affordable meant that suddenly uh, students could think about building their own computers. We're talking about the mid 1970s. Building a computer is nothing you could envision as a student. But suddenly there is a microprocessor that you can buy for money and that allows you to become part of computer development. And it's not a surprise that machines like the Apple computer started exactly based on that CPU uh, and a whole culture, basically a whole Silicon Valley culture of home computer builders uh, started more or less with the invention of this CPU. So there is a cultural significance here that is ingrained in this little piece of hardware, um, which makes it interesting also from a uh, yeah, cultural perspective. The other thing is, so this is the chip, um, and this is the people who invented this chip. And the funny thing is, if you, if you look at this photo, uh, what they held up is the layout of the chip. And this is something like 4,500 transistors. Uh, you can draw a circuit diagram with 4,500 transistors by hand if you like. Uh, so this was also the last kind of computer technology that was still comprehensible by human beings incomplete. And this is relevant for what I'm doing because I'm diving very deep into what the CPU can do and what these computers can do. And I can only do this because they're relatively simple. They are simple enough so that an artist with a technical background can fully embrace the possible uh, capabilities. Uh, the CPU actually drove, um, or micro microprocessors in general, drove a lot of machines we all love. Um, in those, unfortunately, there's no 6502, but this one is, for instance, driven by a 6502, or this one, So, which is not exactly a musical instrument. Um, the 65 or oh, the Commodore CBM 8032, as seen in this photo, <clears throat> have this iconic nature, uh, which I find still very pleasing visually. Uh, but there's more to it. The other thing is that this kind of green characters on black screen uh, 
seem to symbolize nowadays a future of the past. And that is something that I find, again, culturally interesting. The, there was a time where a green screen um, with text and slowly building up graphics uh, were pointing into something that is not yet there, but might be really, really cool and interesting. Um, and nowadays, you look at it and it seems outdated, or it became a very strange cultural connotation, uh, for instance, in terms of cybercrime and stuff like this. So suddenly the green screen became iconic. And here is a proof of concept uh, just from today, uh, a screenshot of just a Google search for cybercrime. And it's kind of exactly the, the green fluorescent aesthetic that the old computers have. Uh, I have no idea why this happened culturally, but obviously it did. And this means if you perform with these machines uh, on stage, you always carry this subtext of this future of the past with you. And I kind of like that. The, the other thing is, of course, that there's a, an inherent uh, brutal minimalism. And this, to me, brings me to the core of why I like uh, working on this project. And this minimalism is simply due to the fact that the capabilities of these machines are so limited. So we have this uh, cathode ray display, CRT, and on this display, all the computer can do is it can display 24 rows of 80 characters. And these characters are not freely defined. This is a, prix a fixed set of characters, uh, the so-called uh, PET ASCII code. So this here is everything that I can draw. That's it. So uh, um, in a musical sense, uh, I have a, a very reduced scale and I have a very, very reduced palette here. Uh, if I want to do anything graphically, I have to find interesting ways to use these little um, graphic symbols to create something that is pleasing. And ironically, I found exactly that liberating. I mean, I, I grew up in the 1980s uh, as a teenager with limited budget and making electronic music was a big challenge because everything I wanted to do was completely out of reach financially. And I was happy when at some point I could afford a six voice uh, polyphonic synthesizers and uh, build myself a small mixing desk. And this was how I started making music. Uh, nowadays, the situation is, of course, a situation of complete abundance where everything is possible. And going back to a medium that is extremely reduced, to me, felt quite liberating because I had to relearn how I think about structure, how I think about sound, how I think about composition from a perspective of extreme limitation. And in this regard, I feel that this project points way beyond to its manifestation during the concert I give, but it opened a door for me to perceive my own work in a different light. And I think this alone uh, justifies, to a certain extent, the effort. I, I will come back to this uh, at some point, because I think there is something really, really essential to, to learn from that, that the, uh, not every project you, you do needs to be successful in itself, uh, because this kind of... Uh, bit cheesy thing of, yeah, the, the, the way or the, the path to something is the, the goal. Uh, there is a certain truth to it. Uh, you can always take something home from a project, even if the outcome at the end is not really the, the way you wanted it to be. But uh, luckily enough in this project, it turned out to actually be more convincing than I did anticipate. Uh, I was working on this project for three years, almost four now, 
and that's a long time to dedicate a significant amount of energy to. And there were lots of moments of great doubt. And it was those moments where I had interactions with other people and showed them interim results and where I got this feedback that something is in this aesthetics uh, that is really worth uh, following up. And that helped me a lot because <clears throat> with a project like this, at some point you really consider giving up simply because you think it's, uh, it's a waste of time. Uh, if we go back to a bit more detail to this uh, specific computer screen thing, uh, the specific behavior, uh, which in, in, in sonic terms is like similar to a specific timbre of instrument you love, uh, a property that points beyond the, the obvious features, uh, a property that points beyond saying, yeah, it has an oscillator and a filter. Uh, a property that is really, really specific is how exactly is this phosphor actually looking when you um, closely look at the screen. And it has a few really interesting properties. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the technical process is that an electron beam is hitting the screen which has this phosphorescent paint on the inside and it lits up this little piece of phosphor there, which, well, then is green. But there's a few interesting details here. Uh, the first detail is that the electron beam is moving horizontal. And that means if uh, pixels are on, they form a line. As you see, every horizontal pixel that is uh, combined is a line, whilst the ver vert vertical pixels are obviously true pixels. So uh, there is a a slight difference between how nowadays video look and how these things look. And also there's a certain decay. So if, <clears throat> if a, a character is turned off, it does not disappear immediately. It disappears with a slight decay, just like a decay on a, on a um, sustained node on a synthesizer. And all these things together, plus the pure monochromatic experience, uh, lead to an aesthetic that is very, very uh, distinct and very different from any aesthetic you are most likely to encounter these days. Uh, and this alone makes it standing out in a way. Uh, it's a one hour performance with entirely green monochromatic display. And of course, I was worried at the beginning when I started this project that uh, having one hour of just monochromatic green graphics might be boring. And as a matter of fact, it's the opposite. Uh, it's completely uh, getting its own thing. Uh, it's very pleasing. Um, but at the beginning of the project, I didn't even have an idea that this is going to be a one hour concert piece. Um, so this here is <clears throat> a series of screenshots from the performance. And I forgot to mention that on my website, there is a video excerpt that gives a bit an idea how these things sound and how they look. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to show this now, I think. Maybe afterwards in the Q&A, it depends a little bit on how much time we have. What you can see here in this series of photos is a sense of development. So indeed, uh, the graphics do form some sort of video. And this is again something that I was not very sure in the beginning. It was not clear to me uh, <clears throat> if we can manage with this limited technology to get anything that resembles video out of these machines. I was convinced that I could get something that is uh, basically like a slowly processing photo image out of it, but not video. And only after more initial tests uh, I gained more confidence that a video thing is possible. And this was when the idea was born not to make a gallery piece out of it, where there's a slow development and maybe two loudspeakers or something like this in a room and you can immerse yourself into this slow computer doing its stuff. But that there's a chance to do something that is pretty in your face and brutal in a positive way and fast enough to 
get accepted as video. So that was the first step which shaped the, the, the final outcome as a part of an initial research. And I, I come back later to this question about how, how research shapes the outcome. Uh, because there's an interesting property to art uh, and to a certain degree also to scientific research that is different from industrial production. And well, I hope I will find the time to talk about this later. Uh, what you can see here is actually excerpts from uh, four different, five different pieces. So the, um, the last piece with these circular shapes is pretty much the first structure I tried to explore. This is a slightly more enhanced algorithm, but it was one of the first things that I tried to get done because uh, doing something circular um, on such a machine is a challenge in itself since doing mathematics and cosine and stuff like this is impossible uh, due to the limitation in speed. So you have to find other ways around it. Uh, the second piece, the one which the pretty filled um, vertical screen is a very fast flickering piece uh, that plays a bit with the overwhelming um, brutal aesthetics that is also possible. Um, then comes a piece that has a very slow organic movement and these three uh, already give an idea that there is a, a variety of expressions possible uh, in gesture, in speed, in overall pace within this limited framework. And this is again something that reminds me to the properties of a musical instrument. If you start to abstract from the simplicity of the technology, but focus on uh, topics of development, of shape, of order, uh, of duration, <clears throat> you end up at the core questions of composition. And if you find meaningful sequences of events in a meaningful timing, uh, you can create something, I believe at least, that is very pleasing, even if the the, the, the interface or the, the possible output uh, is very, very uh, minimalistic, very reduced. Uh, and the opposite is of course also true. Uh, even with the most advanced technology, uh, if, if what you do doesn't make sense uh, in terms of a meaningful development over time, uh, it becomes this kind of set, uh, meaningless demo reel where every single frame is amazing but after five minutes, you're losing interest. And since I cannot be overwhelming with these technologies uh, by the technology itself, I have to be convincing with the composition. And this is again something that uh, helped me a lot when I was working on this project and which also allowed me to learn things that point way beyond this specific concept piece. Uh, there are some cultural references that I find worth mentioning. <clears throat> and this is particularly uh, early 1960s uh, computer art, uh, because the, the pioneers of computer art, um, like Manfred Mohr here, for instance, or Frieda Nake, <clears throat> uh, they were also forced to come up with very simple, very formalized, ideas uh, what they want to do and in the reduction that was necessary uh, in, in the strict formalism of those ideas lies something that by a nowadays perspective looks incredibly fresh and by, by no means outdated this is what i find so fascinating uh, like this this drawing here on the left uh, P102 random walk plotter drawing from 1969. This is based on a um, very, very reduced uh, algorithm. It's 
there's <clears throat> not much going on in terms of computation there. It's a very, very simple set of rules. But as a matter of fact, by applying the, the correct weighting functions to how often are certain things likely to have versus other things, uh, what is the possible thickness of those lines? What are the constraints? Uh, by applying those careful, careful uh, properties to something that seems to be very simple in the first glance, you get a very distinct result uh, that by no means looks random. <clears throat> it looks very st structured and very sculptured. And that is something which I very much embrace with the old computers, uh, finding exactly techniques and algorithms that are simple enough to be actually computed by technology from 40 years ago, yet producing results that are um, sufficiently complex to be visually and sonically pleasing. And uh, as a matter of fact, the, the more I occupy myself with these machines and with coding in 8-bit assembler, um, <clears throat> the more I feel it's completely endless. There is no boundaries uh, apart my imagination. Uh, at the beginning, I was much more insecure about how much can I pull off uh, with limited te technology. And I learned more and more that the limit is really just, uh, um, in this case, my personal imagination of what I can do. And um, combining the this fascination for an obsolete technology with the ability to search the internet turned out to be uh, extremely helpful because, for instance, I found papers about sound generation with these limited architectures. And there were people in the mid 1970s who were incredibly smart uh, and came up with very, very clever ways to write sound algorithms for um, such platforms. And uh, I learned a lot from those. And it showed me again that there is uh, an enormous amount of possibilities out there. And it's just a question of finding the right idea. Um, <clears throat> talking about cultural references, uh, of course, I'm referencing myself too. Um, it is just kind of inherent in artistic production that at some point, you develop a certain set of, uh, let's say, topics you're interested in, uh, certain aesthetic categories or certain patterns or gestures uh, or also forms of presentation and so on. Um, and when when people ask me, how I do all the seemingly different things like doing installations, doing concerts uh, in a club context, doing concerts in a more academic context, doing uh, my laser stuff, uh, doing the concept of the old computers. What do all these things have in common? Is there something like a, a signature there? Then I would say, yes, there is absolutely a signature uh, because it's all based on a similar set of things that I find interesting. And this also implies that I can transfer the knowledge from one domain to another domain. So everything I learned when thinking about music, I could apply to my visual installations. Everything I learned from setting up visual installations and dealing with the limitations there, I can feed back to my musical compositions. And this also uh, helps me having the confidence to approach a project uh, that I have not done before, even when I sometimes think I might waste my time doing something that has no meaning. Uh, it, it happens very often to me that I'm thinking, why do I program now? Why, why do I write code? Why do I try to understand old computer hardware? I could be in the studio instead and make music. And that's certainly true to a, an extent, 
<clears throat> but every time I solved one of those problems that kept me from doing things, uh, and every time I managed to explore a new technique further, I learned something on the way that later turns out to be useful for other things. Um, let's see what else we have. Oh, talking about learning. I have a little bit of background in electronics coming from this family background of engineers. And as I mentioned before, the, the 6502 CPU and the computers from the late 70s, very early 80s, uh, have something in common that makes them interesting for uh, artistic exploration. And this is the fact that they can be completely understood. This here uh, is the, the circuit diagram of the main board of the CPU part of the main of this AT32 computers. And <clears throat> not just that it's actually hand drawn, but also the fact that I can tell you about every single wire you see here, what it does and why it is there. So this is really something that you can read like an open book, um, which is completely impossible for any uh, computer technology that is only a few years younger than this one. <clears throat> Already computers in 1982 or something like this became so complex that it would not be possible anymore to look at the circuit diagram and understand what's going on. But with this computer, it is still possible. And this is important because if you want to explore something to do things that were not originally intended, or at least uh, no primary focus on, uh, it is helpful to understand the, the little details. And these little details, for instance, allowed us to find a way to network five computers for a performance situation. Uh, you have to imagine these are machines. There is no MIDI interface. There is no Ethernet port. There is no USB port <clears throat> or any of the things you take for granted these days. Um, these machines have a so-called user port, which is just eight lines coming out from the CPU or from a connected interface chip. And they are present on a connector at the back. That's it. There is no software layer that tells you what these lines are doing. It's just a technical opportunity for someone who is technically minded to do something. Which means in order to use these computers in a concert situation, I have to understand the circuit diagram. There is no other way. So in one way, this seems to be uh, prohibitive for artistic expression. Uh, on the other way, once you look at the circuit diagram, uh, it also guides you to how to do it. So there is this, this interesting duality here between, yes, it requires to dive deep into a certain aspect of technology that you can happily ignore when you make music or whatever with current technology. But on the other side, this is far more open than most technology nowadays, which means it's also open to extension. It's open to manipulation and to uh, exploration that ultimately is very satisfying. Uh, this is a photo of the board. Um, and well, there could be a lot to say about that. But the most important part is that on the bottom right corner, <clears throat> there's these two rows of pins. And these two rows of pins are there so that someone can extend the capabilities of these computers by adding another circuit board. Uh, this was absolutely intentional in 1980 uh, because the idea of such a computer system was that if you're using it, uh, you might want to use it for your own purpose. And this own purpose might include that you need to build custom hardware. Uh, that's why this documentation is provided and is so essential because in order to make your own hardware, you need to understand it. And this is an invitation to do so. 
So it's a, actually quite different from a closed system of nowadays where you have a very limited access via a so-called API, um, but you are a guest on a machine that does all kinds of things and you have no clue about. On this machine, you become a co-author. So, and we actually made use of that by adding um, a two-channel digital to analog converter. These machines don't have a sound chip. Forget about it. This is too, too old for that. Uh, the little piezo speaker on the left side is kind of uh, driven by a side effect of the parallel input-output chip. And it just does enough to make a little bit of beep sound. This machine has no audio capabilities whatsoever. Uh, in order to make anything that is in some way musical, you have to add your own hardware. So one of the things we did was we built an extension board that um, has two 8-bit digital to analog converters, something that again in 1980 was already possible and people did it. Uh, so we augmented this machine to be more useful for audio, but with a technology that felt totally in, in sync with the 1980s uh, and not something contemporary. Uh, <clears throat> this year became my favorite literature for two years. This is basically the book that tells you how to program this uh, microprocessor. And the interesting part is you need maybe 30 pages in this book to get a complete understanding of how this here works software-wise. Uh, this is an incredible feeling of liberation at some point, because again, unlike a contemporary machine, when I run my sound routines on this machine, or when I run the video routines on this machine, this machine is doing nothing else. Uh, there is no notion of multitasking or something like this. Uh, it does one thing. 100% of the time. And this again allows uh, to do things that are quite radical. Uh, for instance, the, the sampling rate for the audio depends on the complexity of the algorithm. There is no notion of a fixed sampling rate. A sampling rate is whenever uh, your code can write to the converter, then there's a sound sample. Uh, if your code is complex, then the sample rate is low. If your code is too complex, it just doesn't do anything meaningful anymore audio-wise because it's too slow. Uh, so there's all kinds of interesting trade-offs here that force you to come up with creative solutions. And I come back to this also later. Uh, what this project also made necessary was the invention of an enormous amount of helper tools around them because since there is no simple way to do anything with these machines, uh, everything to do with these machines requires programming in assembler, which is tedious and effort. Um, there's no way to simulate anything or to copy anything easily. Uh, so in order to develop graphics, I, I wrote a tool that is basically a, a, a graphics program that operates with these uh, graphic symbols which allowed me to, to sketch out visual ideas just for the purpose to see how could they look. And only if they looked convincing um, in the helper tool, then I started thinking about, okay, how can I actually program something like this? How can I make a structure like this happen? And there's an abundance of tools that I had to write for, that per, um, for this project. Um, tools that allow me to do data transfer between a max patch and those machines, uh, tools that convert text for the credits into ASCII and so on and so on. <clears throat> a, a whole universe of things in the back that no one who is going to the concert will ever see, but which are essential for actually making it run. Uh, this here is the additional circuit board which we built with the converters on the right side and uh, the video out. And without going too much into detail, the video out is a tricky one 
because uh, these machines have no video output. Uh, the, I, a computer that can't do video or where the idea of that a computer actually could do video is kind of strange uh, in a time where video projectors uh, were big, expensive and could only handle like very, very low rate television. Uh, the idea of a computer with a video output was not very common. Uh, there is a lot to say about how we got video out of these machines. Uh, it's online on my website. There's a lot of the details about this. I won't go into this now, but um, let's put it this way. It was one of the most complex tasks technically for this project to be able to project an image of these old CRT displays on a contemporary large video screen in a convincing way. Um, we had to go through a lot of detours to make this happen. Um, we had to build another, a lot of other hardware. This is the, the hardware which actually <clears throat> makes sure that we have something like MIDI to connect those machines. Um, so one machine on stage is the sequencer, which just runs the, well, the compositions. One machine does video and three machines do sound. And the reason why three machines do sound is the fact that, again, the complexity of what a machine can do is very limited. So basically, I have a concert with three voices, three monophonic voices. And this is significant because uh, as, as someone who has a big mixing desk and lots of gear, uh, my my tracks in the studio tend to, or my, my compositions in the studio tend to have a lot of tracks. And suddenly I'm confronted with a technology where all I can do is a simple step sequencer with three voices. And I had moments where things didn't sound right. And I felt I kind of lost the idea. And then I was muting one or even two tracks out of three tracks and suddenly the idea came back. So uh, once again, it's amazing how, how much you can take out of a reduced medium if you fully embrace it and how arbitrary on the other side, things can already get if you only have three voices running at the same time. So once again, the, the, the things I learned from that project uh, as far as composition is concerned, uh, turned out to be highly valuable uh, in a way that I did not anticipate at all when I started it. Uh, <clears throat> talking about development, since programming these machines is very tedious, there is not so much uh, trial and error, or let's put it this way, I tried to avoid or we tried to avoid uh, trial and error because it's so time consuming. And that means a lot of the thinking about the structure and the compositions actually had to be done on paper. So that's a, a typical note from my notebook where I think, okay, what, what do we do with those graphic symbols? How do we get from A to B to C? Um, and only if on paper I have a pretty good idea what I want, I start to think about how can I actually program this? And uh, again, this is something that I was not used to because I was so used to the fact that I just hack a max patch and while it's running, I adjust it till it's, it's fine. Uh, but this way of working where pen and paper are my best friends turned out to be beneficial. And I can just encourage people trying to write down things in detail first before coding because ultimately it's faster. Uh, <clears throat> this here is a beautiful one for me historically, because what you see on the left side is my very, very first drawing where I tried to make up my mind, how could a circular structure uh, actually be calculated? What does it mean? Uh, where does it need to be on the screen? Uh, what would be the, the properties? How do I deal with the screen proportions? And, uh, what would I like to achieve? And what you see on the on the back is <clears throat> a, a rendering of the foreground, but a real screenshot from the result on the background. 
And I think the, the screenshot on the background is pretty convincing. So from a, from a sketch on a book with some ideas to a final result that resembles some of those ideas, uh, that's a good feeling of achievement, actually. Uh, here's another thing that goes in a similar direction. You see from uh, May 2016, this this idea of uh, these stacked figures for creating some landscape kind of stuff. And it turned out into a different idea, but still have some vague similarities um, in the concert piece. So what you see here is uh, actually the, the video version on the wall of my workspace and the original computer screen on the machine on the left. And uh, the, the video projection looks OK. But I have to say there is something with these obsolete CRT displays that I think you cannot really replicate with a video projection. Uh, some, some specific property of this um, phosphor decay and the fact that a black on these old screens is 100% black because um, it's not there's a backlight and some cells that are transparent or not, it's an electron beam actually litting up a point. Uh, there is something very specific to the aesthetics, some, some texture, some color uh, that I find amazing. And I, I wonder how, how these obsolete technologies, when they disappear, what they take with them if they disappear. Uh, in, in a way, that's, that's a, a questionable thing for a lot of digital culture, actually. What happens if um, all this electronic culture from the 1920s, uh, early computer art, uh, early installation pieces, when they disappear because the technology can't be repaired anymore? Uh, like, is a Namjoon Pike piece still the same if you replace the CRT displays by an LCD panel? Uh, in my opinion, it's a very, very difficult question to ask. And maybe we have to accept that technology vanishes and that pieces of art vanish with them and that nothing is there forever. Um, maybe it's just a way to think. Uh, here's another nice example <clears throat> of things to look at. And on the, on the left top, you see this idea of inverting squares. And um, this is a piece by um, one of the people who I worked with on this project, who basically came up with the same idea, uh, which I find interesting because there's obviously some emergent properties here where the medium is actually leading to the results because it's kind of obvious, but of course not every obvious choice is a good choice. And this is where these interesting resonances happen between an artistic precondition of what are the things that I find interesting uh, on one side and uh, the, <clears throat> the possible results on the other side. Uh, also interesting is when, when you think about such a project, I'm not only thinking about the screen. I, I think about the presentation a lot too. At the end, what I want to achieve is a complete experience, a concert as an experience. You come to a concert and it's interesting from the first second till you leave the, the concert hall. And therefore, the stage is, of course, essential. And <clears throat> if you look at these two drawings, also from early 2016, uh, the, the first drawing was, OK, I have this table with this one single computer on the side of the stage and a spotlight on me, and I have the projection. Um, a few pages later, it already turned into five computers and the chair and the other projection, which is apart from the fact that I now mirrored this by um, 180 degrees. It's exactly the setup that I finally um, did stick with. Uh, this is just a sketch that came up. And I find it fascinating that sometimes uh, something that seems to be a, just a random thought 
when it's kept, becomes the essence of something. So there was this one moment of clarity where I had a vision about this is how it has to look. And this is then how we decided actually it has to look. Uh, I have no idea how these ideas happen. That's a bit of the magic of um, inspiration. At some point, something is there. And the question is only, do you take it serious? Do you discard the idea or do you make a sketch? Um, and does it stick? In this case, it did stick, and it turned out to be the right thing to do, I believe. Uh, <clears throat> maybe also interesting when it comes to organizing a, a large composition is the, the question of order. Uh, so what happened with, uh, with the creation of this piece was that we developed individual, basically, scenes. Uh, so scenes or themes, um, but there was no sense of, uh, of a large composition. There was just a sense of, okay, this is interesting and this is interesting and that part is interesting. And only at a very, very late stage of the development, I started to look at everything we did, both sonically and visually and try to sequence it in a meaningful order for the concert. <clears throat> so what you see here is basically on the left side, the uh, some abstract drawings of the individual pieces in an order that makes sense, starting with black on the beginning and the credits at the end. And again, there were some decisions that are pretty clear. I knew that I wanted to have this eye circular piece and the drone sound I knew that I wanted to have this very massive, brutal piece right before. Uh, so it's a bit like a puzzle. There are some ideas that are obvious from the very beginning about the order, and then there's some parts that are unclear. And so I shift around some of these things until the, the thing seems to make sense. And actually, I think we were happy with this project because the decisions we made about which order of pieces uh, turned out to be really, really meaningful. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there was not much um, revisiting of those ideas. The, the first idea about the order turned out to be really um, the thing. Okay, lots of detail thinking. I learned a lot about analog circuit design. Uh, I had to think about how everything is connected. And we had to come up with an idea for a sequencer that <clears throat> is simple enough to be coded with in a few weeks, but powerful enough to drive things. And uh, I'm not going into a lot of details here, but basically, as you can see, it's just hacking numbers somewhere. So the, the right side is only the visualization, the left side is memory addresses inside the computer. Um, and putting in events means directly writing um, bytes into the memory. It's a bit insane, but hey, it works. Uh, the audio that comes out from these old machines with these 8-bit converters is quite brutal. And there is a certain aesthetics to it, which I really like. Um, but I also figured out that this aesthetics benefits a lot from uh, a, bit of an <clears throat> a bit of enhancement. And I decided to add some reverb and also some pitch shifting. And the great thing is that I got hold of this French pitch shifting unit, the Publisson. Uh, which also allows to freeze sounds. And the combination of this uh, pitch shifting um, looper from 1978 and the um, RMX-16 reverb from 1981 basically allowed me to add a certain layer to the sonic palette of this performance that I felt necessary without the need to use technology that is younger than these computers. Uh, the only 
a slight cheating here is the, the, the PCM80 on the top, but it could have been replaced by an equally old machine, but this would have been just a bit more expensive. And so therefore there's a bit of a cheating here with a slightly more modern um, reverb. But basically the idea was that all the sound generation and all the sound processing should have been possible in 1980. That was my arbitrary limit I put on this. And with these effect units and the three computers and a mixing desk, I'm basically having everything in place to create sound for one hour. Uh, since there's no means to store anything, uh, I figured that I have to solve some practical issues, which is <clears throat> I need to readjust the mixing desk and the knobs of these machines in between the pieces. So I made these sheets of paper here uh, where just like on old analog synthesizers, I have to mark where each knob has to be for each piece. And of course, during the concerts, I never um, replicate these sheets in completeness. So there's all kinds of mistakes that can happen, which also means that each performance is quite different. Uh, what else to say? There's a lot of more things to say. But I'm towards the end of my monologue here. Um, I like to move a little bit into a more abstract realm from away from this uh, specific performance to the differences between engineering and artistic expression. Uh, because as I mentioned, I, I come from this engineering family background and I have a profound understanding of the ideas of engineering, but I had to fight my way uh, towards the arts. If you engineer a product, then what happens uh, normally is that the motivation for doing it is a certain type of necessity. Like the necessity could be, okay, um, we, we need to build a traffic light or a tool and there's a certain idea then some people think about what is the properties of the thing we need to build and you define a set of features feature a feature b feature c uh, and then there's a development process and at the end is a product and ideally the product just fulfills everything that the specification wants uh, practically things are a bit more elaborate so you develop something that is a prototype and then people test it, people use it. And well, some things work, some things don't and some things change. So as a result of that process, um, feature A, which is maybe the core feature, um, stays untouched. Feature B turned out to be too complicated or users don't understand it or not necessary or whatever. And feature C got a bit modified because <clears throat> well, figured out that it could be slightly different. At the end of this process, which could of course be repeated a few times, there is a product that is complete. And this idea of complete is interesting here because complete means it meets all the feature requests. Everything there you can check and yes, it works. So yes, the clock uh, rings in the morning as an alarm clock. Yes, it displays the time. And yes, um, I can read it from the distance. What none of these things say is if the result is fun or inspiring, because these are soft criteria that cannot be um, really applied to that. You can only apply these, these rational criteria to it. So now, um, of course, when we use a product, we have our own personal idea if we like it or not. But this is subjective <clears throat> and the rest is quite objective. Now compare this with artistic expression. Uh, <clears throat> what's the motivation here? The motivation is not that we solve a problem because uh, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that art solves any problem. So the motivation is a desire to, to share something or to express a feeling or whatever 
or that the artist needs money, which I think is also a valid thing to <coughs> consider. Uh, so we have an idea and we derive a concept and we say, okay, we like this, this piece to work in the club. We like to have this, we like to have that. And we develop it and the result is a work. And we all know that this is not true. Um, because we have a similar issue, we create something and at some point during the process, we figure out that a lot of our initial ideas don't work. We discover new things um, and we develop it. And at the end, something comes out that has some of the properties of the original idea, but very likely also a lot of things that are very different. And unfortunately, we have no way to evaluate the, the, the piece of art. We don't even know if it's finished or not. So there's no objectivity for achievement. We, we can apply criteria like how many likes we have. Um, but then we know things that we find really, really crappy, which a lot of people love. So that doesn't work. Um, we can apply a lot of other criteria and there's always good reasons why someone else dismisses the criteria as inappropriate. Which means by the end of the day, the only thing we can um, consider is do we ourselves feel that it makes any sense? Uh, the, the thing gets more complicated by the fact that sometimes we develop things that lead to nowhere, where we just give up on a piece. Uh, because we found that we are not getting where we want to go. Uh, or we come up with something that points in a different direction um, that might lead to a future idea that can become a different project. But still, we are kind of lost. And uh, these are the questions that I occupied myself a lot with when working on this project, which involved having people helping me programming, which involved restor restorating, restoring these old machines, investing a lot of time of labor into something where I was not, not very sure that the results will be satisfying. Uh, but I was just hoping that something come out that at the end of the day um, makes sense. And it did, which was great. Unfortunately, then they came COVID and um, the project for a year was on hold. And now I just gained the momentum again mentally to continue working. And <clears throat> I started to dive into another adventure, a pretty insane adventure, because this whole concept had a, a bit of a logical flaw. And this logical flaw is that everything is created from these old computers, but the sequencer computer needs an external clock, just a beat time clock. And I didn't find a, a satisfying hardware solution for that. So at the moment, I'm a bit cheating and the beat clock comes actually from a Mac mini. And I don't like that because even if it's just a stupid clock signal, it should be um, created by technology from the 1980s. So long story short, <clears throat> I decided I built my own little computer um, called Firebird. And this is the computer. And it's even simpler than the CBM 8032, but based on the same technology, which I learned so much about that I was able to, well, prototype this machine here and it works. And so at the moment, I'm diving deeper into hardware development than I ever anticipated. Doing something which is completely obsolete, technology from 40 years ago. But uh, on the way, I have an enormous amount of fun and I come up with tons of ideas what to do with this computer once it's not a breadboard anymore, but in an enclosure. And so that pretty much occupies my brain if I'm not just giving a talk. And I think that's the perfect ending for this because this is my last slide. Um, is it? Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, this was the question here. 
the haha this is a very important end we should not have omitted that so what happens is i'm i'm building this this crazy project here which seems to be even more out of this world um this has so little to do with a finished product so why am i doing it um why not well first of all building obsolete hardware is not seen as art there's nothing you put in a gallery um this is not even state-of-the-art contemporary stuff you know if i could say hey i'm building this ai machine or this bitcoin miner then it would have at least some significance culturally <clears throat> well it can't do anything that you couldn't be doing better with an arduino or a raspberry pi so why doing it with this old technology uh it's far more expensive putting all the development costs into perspective and it takes an enormous time to build so it makes no sense whatsoever um but it solves a tiny problem in consistency that bothers me and it's adding some minor feature to my old uh, commodores uh, which means that i can make um, music pieces with swing uh, because that will be one feature of this clock generator seems to be a little bit less for all the effort well there's more and the more is the true motivation is that it's fascinating and uh, i enjoy doing it and it forces me to learn something new which once i achieved it is again satisfying and i hope that it will inspire me in ways that i just don't know and it also i hope that it will help me to create things in the future so i invest in a future where i have no idea about and this sums pretty much up why i'm doing things i do things because i hope that something comes out in the future that will in retrospective explain me why i did these things in the first place so that's my end here let's see if you are still present and because i only saw my screen now aha uh -huh. it seems we are still running and i need to stop sharing yes yeah we're still here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much robert that was a really lovely ending um really appreciate kind of the depth that you went into around your own creative process and hearing how the kind of engineering and computing come together with sound and creativity and i think really just laying bare those struggles kind of that that kind of um yeah the difficulties of artistic practice creative practice when you don't know where it's going but you do feel kind of compelled to pursue something but also the way in your specific practice that that intersects with kind of an engineering background or a kind of engineering and computational inquiry um yeah you touched upon so many things and i was thinking about how that limitation that you were talking about that sometimes breeds or aids creativity um, kind of chimes with a lot of our students' experiences over the past year when we've talked a lot about how to be creative under constraint. You know, we don't have access to all the things that normally maybe inspire us <laughs> um, or kind of actual machines and workshops that we normally have access to. Um, and yeah, I don't want to overplay that because that's genuinely been difficult, but um, there is also this sense kind of in a very like sign of the times that we've got so many options at our fingertips that it can also be overwhelming so i think this tendency yeah. to go back and reduce things um yeah is a really kind of rich one to explore as your presentation really showed us um yeah you touched on so many things and i really appreciate it. i also loved that kind of diagram around the kind of aims and goals of engineering versus the aims and goals of art and yeah brilliant <laughs> i love that kind of um yeah analytical thinking around creativity which is kind of knowingly um at odds with many kind of creative processes um well thank you for such um yeah a rich presentation um let's have a short break and then we'll come back and start with the student q a group so um i make it 3 43 um let's say it's five minutes okay 348 is that too long do people want to get going with the questions 
let's say 347 and then we'll probably start back at 348 okay see you all shortly Okay, so um, I'm gonna make presenters the students who I have done as being in this week's um, Q and A team. Um, so just give me a second to do that. And yeah, as I said before, it would be great um, if we just start with the student questions, and then we'll open it up to the wider audience. Um, after the students have had a chance. Monica, you're also done. Um, okay, maybe if, if you're down in the group and I've not made you a presenter, please just maybe put your hand up. I think I've got everyone I can see. So, right, who wants to start off? And I can also activate the Hello. audio and video. Hi, Callum. Hiya. Um, off. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Am I okay to just get going? Yeah, please go ahead. Cool. I'd just like to say thank you, Robert, for the lecture. It was super interesting. I always find the use of uh, um, obsolete technology really fascinating. So, yeah, definitely right up my street. So, um, yeah, me and um, 
me and Monica were going to ask um, some of the questions from the uh, the Q and A Padlet. So I'll just get um, get going. I'll put them in the chat as well, so um, you'll be able to read them. But I'll read them out as well. So I'll start with this um, first question from Cairo, and that's: um, Have you thought about including um, other sensors in your audio visual installations, such as smell or touch? Uh, not really. Uh, actually, smell is interesting because I find smell super. Uh, important part of our uh, sensory experience but every scenario that uh, I'm aware of didn't really work out uh, actually there were in the 80s or 70s some futuristic ideas of smell organs or something like this so enhancing television by providing a machine that can um, activate some sense depending on the context of the television screen um, for practical reasons that never worked out. So uh, I think the, yeah, the short answer is I've been, I find the topic interesting, but I have no real uh, inspiration about how to approach it. Um, it seems to be a, a topic where you have to have a great idea first and then you explore it. So. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Monica, would you like to do the next question or are you happy if if uh, you want me to keep going. Yes, I can read it. Thank you. Okay, cool. Hi, hi everyone. Um, also, thank you, Robert, for doing the presentation and doing this Q&A for us. I also want to mention that um, I had the pleasure to attend your performance, the CBM 8032 in 2018. So I think that's great. And I'm really excited to ask you questions. Um, okay, this question is asked by Milo. And um, I'm, I'm going to it, paste it in the chat. So. Given our UK context of COVID plus Brexit, are there any good case studies of online presentations of sound that you, that you recommend? Uh, I have to admit yeah, that yeah. I, oh, sorry. I, <clears throat> I basically used the whole lockdown situation to also lock down personally. And instead of occupying myself with figuring out what happens outside the world, uh, I very much focused inwards. So uh, I am unfortunately the wrong person to ask this question because I have not spending too much attention, paying too much attention to that. So I don't know. Okay, thank you. Thanks anyway. Um, Colin, do you want to ask another one? Yep, sure. Um, I'll just put it in the chat. So um, Matthew asked, uh, during lockdown, have you seen in it an increase in remote collaboration in your practice? If so, which software do you use? There is a list of tools in Ableton for um, Ableton's best practice for collaborating remotely article. From that, um, from that list, plus any other tools that spring to mind, what setup would you recommend for a remote Ableton collab? Requirement is that it is technically simple, free and effective for a globally distributed live performance where quality is a higher priority than latency? Well, unfortunately, there the answer is the same. Um, since I didn't occupy myself with lots of um, uh, interaction with other people in the last year, uh, I have not explored any of these things. So unfortunately, <laughs> another question where I have to say, I don't know. Oh, that's all right. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I'll hand you back over to Monica. OK, so I have another one. And it's asked by, um, oh, I don't know, it's just an anonymous person. But OK, uh, it's given that this year search towards NFT, how do you see the future of music distribution? Are there any artists you're following in the NFT space? Um, as far as NFT is concerned, again, a topic I tried to avoid. Um, also, I'm aware of the heated discussion about the impact it has both on the art world and on the environment. Uh, but I failed to inform myself deeply enough to be informed. But what I noticed is uh, that on, on a personal level, that the fact that we are now so used to communicate with tools like Slack, like Zoom, whatever, uh, 
that it changed at least the way I interact with a lot of people I used to interact with on a personal level. And the fact that we do this uh, class here now and this Q&A and everything, uh, that became very natural. And this to me implies that artistic collaboration via such means uh, also becomes more natural. So the, the, the long-term impact of the lockdown and the fact that we all got used to re remote collaboration, uh, I'm pretty sure will have an impact on how we perceive uh, the collaborative practice when we do art and also distribution, of course, because suddenly uh, we are much more used to the fact that something is completely um, immaterial. And uh, therefore, the yeah, I, I just believe that the, the immaterial quality of art becomes more accepted as much as the uh, immaterial quality of a personal exchange becomes accepted. And that means we will probably see more uh, art coming up and a higher acceptance for art that exists only in a virtual domain than before. Uh, so that's interesting, uh, completely independent from uh, from the distribution model and from the financing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Callum, do you want to take over? Yeah, now? sure. Um, so Kai asked um, the next big thing, um, what technology and processes do you see on the horizon in terms of creative sound and sound manipulation? Even though it's been around for a while now, things like granular synthesis feel so advanced. What, um, what kind of stuff do you think we can look forward to in the future? Uh, that's an interesting one. I mean, um, I tend to be a, a bad prophet, but I see indeed some great potential for everything uh, AI and neural networks have to offer. Uh, because uh, just the fact that you can search for sounds, you can classify sounds uh, in a new way, uh, you can draw connections between sounds, or you find ways to manipulate structure and sound in a new way. Uh, is something I, I feel has the potential to become really exciting. Uh, there's an interesting topic in this regard that has to do with the abundance of, of things. Uh, everyone nowadays has a gigantic library of sounds. And, but we end up always using the, the 10 folders we know best. Uh, if there would be a, a very easy way to have a search for a similarity. Like let's assume that the, the browser in your favorite uh, audio application uh, doesn't show you folders with names, but <clears throat> clouds of similar sounds. And you're looking for a specific percussion sound and you move a little bit left, right, up, down with your mouse. And you come up with another percussion sound that is perfect for your need. Uh, and um, you use it and you think it's fantastic and later you wonder what it is and you figure out it's a recording from your trash can falling down which you never considered to be a useful bass drum. Uh, so I think there is possibilities here where a simple addition to an existing tool set um, will make a lot of a difference and the simple addition is some AI that allows to sort things um, not even sound generation, just sound organization. Um, and there are similar structures in place for composition, for creating rhythm, for um, making decisions for harmonic content or whatsoever. So my assumption is that not the pure synthesis is what is going to be exciting in the future, but the things that help us to create a larger form, a larger shape, uh, because that's something that software really doesn't address at the moment. <clears throat> we focus on the sound design, but as long as, as soon as we enter the question of how long is this piece? How long is this part? How long is that part? Does this part need to be repeated? Should this be repeated, but in a different way? <clears throat> there, we have no technological support yet. And I can see that in the future, there will be tools that can help us here tremendously. And that's scary and interesting. 
Yeah, I think there's definitely a reliance on co convenience as well in the sound world. Um, yeah, and I think once you break that kind of convenience, it might um, the creative opportunities will become far more um, open to uh, artists. Um, Monica, I think I think, I think oh, convenience is a very sorry. Uh, convenience is a very important point here. Uh, the the things that are most successful are. For instance, if you think about instruments, are the ones that <clears throat> allow you to quickly shape your results. Uh, it's not necessarily the, the most complex synthesis algorithm in the background. It's the access. And if someone comes up with something that creates complex but predictable results using five parameters, then everyone will love it. Um, if something takes a, reading a 500 page manual, uh, even if it's the most interesting process you can imagine, um, people will not very likely incorporate it in their work. So there is something about simplicity that is important here. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, Monica, which, uh, would you like to ask? Yeah, next question? Uh, okay. So my question is actually my question, and it's kind of related to that. And um, Okay, so as a software developer and artist, what aspects of using technology and art together do you find the most exciting? And also, do you think that experimental electronic music will become mainstream, looking at the increasing av availability of different tools, such as live co coding or interactive programming or exper experimental music labels like PAN and festivals like Ansel? It's kind of Which two questions in one, but... Yeah, yeah. Um... What I find most exciting, um, if, I think at the end of the day, what I'm looking for as a human being is <clears throat> I want to touch by something on an emotional level. And if there is any tools that help me expressing either myself um, by creating music that I like or creating art that I like or which helped me to experience what other people created, um, that's uh, significant. So the, at the end of the day, even if we talk about technology, the motivation for me is always some, some fascination, something that is very, in a, in a positive way, connected to as a positive force, um, a sense of aesthetics, a sense of achievement, a sense of um, liberation also maybe depending on the tools you use, like the liberation you can have as someone sitting in a small apartment and having your headphones on and listening to wide lush reverb, um, which make your little room disappear and you feel you're in much bigger space because you're immersed in your own sonic world. Uh, the other thing is electronic experimental music mainstream. I don't even know if this is, if, if this is desirable uh, because in, in some way uh, the internet made everything accessible for a lot of people. And if mainstream means that it runs in every shoe shop, <clears throat> then I'd rather don't want it. I mean, house music became kind of mainstream because every car commercial or and every shopping mall runs some sort of lukewarm house music. Uh, that's music as uh, a wall paint. Uh, I'm not even sure if I would want that. So I'd, I'd rather think the opposite maybe. What can we do to keep music exciting what can we do to push limits is it possible to still push limits can we still present something that is unique uh, i found this is more this is more interesting than than the other way around um, because at the end of the day everything that once was experimental either disappears or becomes mainstream and <clears throat> so i think yes electronic music absolutely became mainstream and um, yeah, um, programming and interactive programming is something that from a niche became something that a lot of people do. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it's, it has to do with the fact that programming is a skill that now pretty much seems to be mainstream. I mean, 
some sort of scripting everyone somehow does in some context. We're all used to computers. It's not something for specialists anymore. So uh, I, I feel that there is, um, shit, I lost it. Sorry, but I think I answered it all anyway. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. I, I definitely agree with this. And you know, th these days we say that probably in 10 years, everyone's gonna know programming and stuff. So probably uh, I guess this is maybe how the future will look like. Um, okay, Colin, do you want to ask another one? Uh, yeah, sure. I've, um, so I've got a question from Dean and that's um, in the interview on your website with uh, is Gerard Bez, Bells, you described the landscape of the Berlin EDM scene in the 90s as one with the as one with an abundance of material space, lots of squatting, and where the whole realm of money didn't exist. Do you think anything of the spirit of that early earlier era has survived the commercialization of the genre? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, it comes down to a mindset. It is great to have uh, the the ex exterior situation we had in Berlin that certainly um, facilitates exploration. But uh, even if you had all these spaces without the desire for using them in a specific way, um, nothing would happen. So uh, given that, I feel it's really a question of a mindset. Um, find find like-minded people who are willing to discover something new together and you can create a, a spirit where it works. And on one side, we are of course all, I assume, sad about the loss of all these physical spaces. But also now we have all these virtual spaces that I wouldn't say are a substitute because there's something else, <clears throat> but something new came up and this new is equally powerful. I can communicate with people all over the world using social media. Uh, I can make long distance phone calls with video that costs me nothing. Um, back in the 90s, a phone call to someone else in Berlin did cost 20 cent, you know? So uh, one thing gets lost, but there's something else coming up that um, can be explored with a similar mindset. So in that regard, I'm, I'm super optimistic. Yeah, I think I think it's interesting to see how uh, how a uh, spirit has uh, survived through COVID as well. Um, yeah, so you mentioned that. Yeah, definitely very interesting. Um, Monica, do you want to ask another question? Okay, so I think this is going to be the last question. And um, your tra transition machine installation from 2010 focuses on the sonic nature of former industrial environments in Germany that have been transformed into entertainment areas and cultural centers. How, in your opinion, can we find the balance between innovation and history? The balance between innovation and history. Um, that's an interesting one. Um, I, I think the, the question implies uh, what I would like to read in this question that <clears throat> there is a certain way to to deal with history um, as a practice that is connected to innovation. And maybe this loops me back to what I do with these old computers. Uh, because I I'm not interested in a static idea of conserve a history because that doesn't seem to work anyway. As I as uh, mentioned in my talk about the early pieces of computer art that will slowly degrade over time until they disappear. So there is no point in trying to preserve that history as physical artifacts. Um, just as much as at some point um, preserving old ruins of uh, former industrial sites also make no sense anymore because simply um, time kills those ruins. So you you leave them untouched, then they will disappear, or you touch them by repainting them, by repairing them, then they, then they become Disneyland. Uh, 
So we have to accept the fact that history is vanishing. And the only thing we can do to make sense of history is we can take experiences from history or things we learn from there and apply it to things we do in the, in the present in the hope that this will shape the future. So again, in my case, I take machines that are 40 years old. I try to do something that I can do now with the hope that it will be still relevant if I look or listen to it in 10 years. And that's how I try to, to bridge the, 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 the past, the, the present, and hopefully a future. Yes, thank you. I definitely agree with this point of view. And um, OK, so Tim has a question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if you can, if you can ask it, Tim. Hi. Um, yeah, I was um, I was just uh, struck by your creative process because recently I've been kind of trying to challenge my own creative process in a way. Um, so what I thought was um, in terms of like your idea of like gen generating these new ideas get generated over the course of working on another idea does it ever get to the point where you begin to like have another idea from one thing and then start working on multiple things at once and like cross them over or is it very much like a focused on one thing uh, it's a difficult question and a very important one uh i it happens often that whilst working on one thing, I get ideas for other things. And then it's this completely unsolved question of discipline, how to deal with that. Uh, and I don't have a really convincing solution, to be honest. Uh, sometimes I just make notes or I save a work in progress under a different name to come back to it later or uh, I try to keep it in mind, but more often uh, I simply move on with what I feel is the more pressing task and I even forget about the detour that I might have been taken if I would have been more organized. So uh, I think working on multiple things at the same time is actually quite difficult for me. I have to say that already is struggling between serious work for Ableton and serious work for my own artistic thing is difficult. And at the moment, for instance, I'm, I'm writing software for the old computers and I write software for Ableton and it's two completely different platforms which require two completely different mindsets. And I really struggle um, with this multitasking and I would be far happier if I could focus on one of those two things, but can't. <laughs> okay, thank you. Good answer. Thank you for your talk as well. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, cool. Tim. Thank you to our Q&A group. Did you have another one, Callum? Uh, no, I was just going to say if you want to open up to the rest of the chat, no, that's, that's fine because uh, we finished with the um, questions. So. For the Amazing. Thanks. So yeah, anyone who wants to ask a question, please put your hand up. Um, yeah, I just wanted to slip in there on your final point, um, Robert, because I kind of feel that Dean's question talking about that creativity in like kind of 1990s Berlin in the context of London. When it, I, don't, I mean, I'm sure you're kind of familiar with London, but we've got such high kind of rent prices. The students pay so much in fees and there's so much debt. And it's, it's still, yeah. Yeah. I know that things have changed in Berlin since I've left and rent prices have increased and such, but there is still this kind of low-ish rent and this, you know, you don't actually have to work a full-time job to pay, you know, to kind of keep going as much. And there is that more kind of time and space for creative pursuits, which is a lot harder to do in London um, just for kind of material reasons. So I feel that 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 struggle of kind of how capitalism encroaches on creativity is, um, yeah, I think a really crucial question. Um, PJ, would you like to ask your question? You should be able to turn on your microphone. Hi there. Thanks, Robert, for the talk. It's amazing. 
Um, throughout your work, do you find there's a direct relationship between the visual notation and audio notation on a micro level, or is the influence more on a compositional macro level, or does it differ from project to project? Um, well, I mean, I only have two projects where I feel I made a, a serious attempt to combine those two things in a structural way. That's uh, Lumiere with the lasers and this one with the old computers. And uh, for, for Lumiere, my, my decision was that I tried to come up with an idea of a, a unified uh, notation, which basically means that I create an, an audiovisual event. So I, I, I create a shape, a visual shape, and that could be a sample, something as simple as a circle or a bunch of circles uh, expanding rapidly. And then I assign a sound that is very arbitrary, but makes sense to me. Uh, and like a percussion sound that sounds right to this visual experience. And from that moment, I treat those two things as one musical note. And then the whole process of composing is taking this audiovisual note, uh, which I found very powerful because uh, there's an arbitrary decision at the birth of this whole thing, but afterwards uh, it is very consistent. And with the, the old computers, things are a bit more difficult due to the nature of what I'm doing. There's really a basic sequence that, that triggers events and the notation is just saying, okay, on the 16th note, I play this percussive sound or this uh, tone or whatever from one of the computers and I update the, the visual sequence on the other machine. Uh, the, 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 techni the technical necessities are so much defining the aesthetics there that I don't even feel I have very much agency of what I'm doing there, which is of course not true because I build all that. But in a way, a lot of the, 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 the things when it comes down to uh, notation of stuff feels that it's just taking use of emergent properties of what's there. So it's not set that much of a, um, um, a conscious decision out uh, more, the, it's more a technical necessity how how I take care of things there. I don't know if this makes sense to you. Yeah, yeah, perfect sense. Amazing, thank you. <laughs> thank you, PJ. Any other questions? Please put up your hands. Oh, maybe maybe one thing. Sorry, maybe one thing to add. Actually, uh, <clears throat> there is one one property of what I'm using with the old computers that turned out to be far more powerful than I thought. Uh, the the graphics evo um, involve a lot of random variation. So there's chance operations for certain characters to show up at certain positions and things like this, um, which mean there's a lot of computation going on that is kind of unpredictable, but since it's software running, there's, there's patterns there. And there is a quite simple way without too much CPU overhead to take some of the signals from the calculation and also put them out as audio signals. So what I get is out of the video machine on some of the pieces, I get some structured noise that sounds like high-speed modem sounds in a bit, in a way, that are, by the pure nature of the technical process, are 100% in sync with the visual experience. Um, and uh, this turned out to be a, a very, very powerful layer because what it, what it does is it adds a sonic tactile quality to the visuals. Uh, it basically feels that the, the visuals, I mean, everything you, you move in a real space makes a sound. And nothing you move on a screen makes a sound. But by, um, by applying this simple process, uh, suddenly every movement on screen also makes its own sound. Uh, and that is a very, very interesting experience. 
that does not work for a whole composition. But as some subtle layer in the background, uh, it's, it's tremendously powerful. I'm very interested in the relationship between texture and sound, actually. So that's, um, yeah, really interesting. Thank you. Nathan, would you like to ask your question? And PJ, if you could turn off your mic and um, put your hand down, that would be great. Oh, OK. Nathan's typed their question. I'll read it out. Um, Nathan says, I have a vague memory of you speaking about buying those old computers under the heading of what's next in a talk circa 2012. If you could go back to the beginning of this project, what would you say to your 2012 self? I'm not sure if it was that early, um, unless I, I was a visionary, which I completely forgot about. Uh, I know that uh, basically in could, I mean, could be that I have had those things before and I forgot. But what would I say to your um, 2012 or whenever self? Um, I would probably just uh, tell myself to be really relaxed because it's all going to be fantastic. Uh, I, I tend to be really doubtful about what I'm doing. Uh, that might sound contradictory contradictory to how I am capable of talking about it in a situation like this now. You know, I'm, I'm used to talk, I'm used to speak to people and sell myself, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean that I also believe everything. Uh, there's enough situations where I have insane doubts about the quality, the scope, the feasibility of my work, and um, most of the time, in retrospective, things worked out quite well. Uh, and so if, if I could say myself, hey, relax, it's going to be good. It might not be as good as you anticipate, but it might be different. Um, <clears throat> that would help a lot. <laughs> yes, exactly. Imposter syndrome, pretty much. I've given your, your past self a hug instead, an encouraging hug. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, being, being so, that's, that's the, the, the critical thing. If, if you are, if you are raised in a situation where everything you do is seen as perfect. So if, if all the feedback you get all the time is, oh my God, is so great. <clears throat> uh, you, you might lose, uh, focus because you don't know anymore what to do if everything is great. Um, but if all the feedback you constantly get is uh, that makes no sense. Uh, that's equally dis um, disencouraging. So I, ideally, you find the sweet spot where the things you do that are really great are recognized. And the things that you do that are only OK are recognized as well. They are OK. Um, so that gives you the, the, the necessary resonance to, to move on. Uh, I, I think that's. So this comes actually down to communities to a large degree. This comes down to what to do if you want to be a successful artist. Find other people that resonate with your ideas. Uh, because that's the only way to figure out if, uh, if what you do has any external relevance. And in, in, this, uh, in this context, for instance, the, the fact that um, the intern that came in in 2019 to work <clears throat> uh, on the graphics routines, um, that, that she was completely fascinated that, that someone who is uh, in, in her early 20s has never seen those old machines, um, but knows computer science, um, can resonate with these ideas. That gave me a lot of confidence that, OK, if someone from her generation finds this cool and not kind of lame, outdated, whatever, then it might be that there's a chance that my idea resonates to more people. And that does not necessarily imply that if an idea does not resonate to many people, it's a bad idea. Because sometimes we have our own vision and people say, no, nah, it's bullshit, but you 
you have to go through. Um, like you make music in the studio and your best friend says, uh, you have to have this <clears throat> track more straight. And you know by heart that no, it's, it's wrong. Um, and you have to, to basically dismiss your friend's um, suggestions. But sometimes it's also good if you get the feedback that gives you just the confidence to, to move on with something that might be a bit off the track. So, yeah. Thanks. Wow, we're getting a really nice thunderstorm, you know. Oh, really? <laughs> I think that's a really <laughs> point around creative community and how much we all need our, need our peers um, and we need that, that feedback and how valuable that is. Um, yeah, I was really struck also by, um, well, I mean, it resonates with what you're saying about those old, um, that Frida Naka and, um, what was the other guy? I wrote it down. Manfred Moore. Manfred Moore. Um, like, uh, computer art that, I mean, you said kind of, I guess, subjectively, you were like, this is still really beautiful to me, you know, now. Mm -hmm. and that idea of um, when you were explaining the project and how you were very strict to keep it with technologies that only existed in the 80s, but the aesthetic kind of was, is only can only really be of the present. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just fascinating to kind of think around those. Like, what are the what are those? Those are so hard to articulate. Those aesthetic shifts, um, even if you kind of setting that constraint again, that technological limit as a kind of um, parameter to test your own creativity. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just think that's a fascinating kind of framework to work with. Um, maybe something it's, that can take over as well. I mean, one one side effect of this little computer I'm gonna build, which at the end of the day is not this small, is not this breadboard, but a small box that I can put right next to my laptop, is that it allows me to much faster develop sound routines for this old CPU. And uh, even whilst traveling, you know, I can take this with me on a train, uh, which is impossible with the old computers. Uh, so it allows me to, to take some of the experiences I gained in the last years into something that just as a technical artifact allows me to use them in a different context. I mean, I can't even carry this, this. This machine will be of the size of a notebook, so it will be like like a bigger notebook. I can even do a monolake club gig with those sounds and this little computer. So uh, that would be fun. <laughs> Minimizing your setup. Um, wonderful. I think we've got time for another question. If anyone has anything they would like to ask Robert, now is your chance. Before everything's falling apart, it, it seems like the world is collapsing out here now. Wow. <laughs> uh, it's been really windy in London as well, but it's... Um... This year is, is actually, it's quite impressive. Um, it's... Okay, uh, you have now the, the awesome capability ability oh, yeah. to have a glimpse at Berlin storm madness. So I don't know if this comes across, but it's quite mad. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> the weather update. Um, Lauren's got a, a kind of question, question, comment. Yeah. Am I right in remembering that you said that art cannot make a difference? Did you say that? Uh, I, I'm not sure in which context I said too many things. <laughs> you were talking about why the reason why people make art I think in your presentation and you mentioned it I think I don't know if I heard it correctly but I thought you said that art cannot make a difference and I was just curious to know if that if I was right in hearing that okay this was of course of course uh, partially ironic uh, <laughs> because as an artist I, I hope I make a difference by enhancing other people's life, by um, all the ways how art can make a difference. <clears throat> but 
of course, the, the notion of the, the real estate developer and um, those kind of people with those mindsets uh, is different. For them, something that you can't measure uh, in, in bullet points uh, seem to be useless. And I, I feel when it, when it comes to this question of when is something finished, that was the context, I believe, uh, then engineering is so much easier because you have a clear goal set. You can say, okay, this is the, the things I want to achieve. <clears throat> and it's utilitarian by definition. You build a tool, a product or whatever. And there is no utilitarian value to art. And this is also why it's unclear when it's finished. And so my my question basically, or my my ironic question was that yeah, art um, is meaningless. Yeah. Oh, I don't think art's meaningless. <laughs> I think I think art can be used as a form of communication, especially when there's like important topics that it can be quite complicated and it can be that medium in between that can uh, break it down and make it more uh, digestible to people and perhaps mm -hmm. spread important messages so to me i think that art can make a difference in that in that in that sense that's an interesting point i i think um I, and i completely agree uh maybe it was a very narrow-minded um comment in this regard because if i think about books uh, movies Anything that as a medium inherently tells a story that can be written down, um, of course it can convey so much meaning. Uh, and potentially even the things I do can convey some meaning that go beyond and help people. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm even underestimating the, the impact it can have. That, that's, that's very likely, I guess. <laughs> Your work is making a difference. It's shedding light on on things that you, people find useless, which actually can be reused for different purposes. Mm -hmm. So it's making a difference. <laughs> but yeah, thank you, thank you for your answer. Thanks, Lauren, and I agree with you. Um, more questions here. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean we're out of time. I don't know if you have a few more minutes, Robert. I don't want to. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I mean, I watched the world collapsing outside, but I'm fine. Okay, well, let's not try and go over uh, more than five minutes, but uh, we have one question from yeah. Yusuf and one from Manoli. So let's take Yusuf's first. Okay, uh, I'll try to be quick. Um, I wanted to ask, as uh, the, uh, a creator of software, uh, Ableton, how do you um, balance the mix between business and uh, consumer consumerism and uh, like making making a living and arts uh, and creation, because at, yeah. at the end of the day, like uh, people need to eat, you know. Like. That's a, a very very difficult question, honestly, because uh, or it's a simple one. The my my motivation to to do things. Uh, it comes from just a fascination for some topics. And I am just historically have been put in a position where I'm this 50-50 person between an artist and an engineer. And it just put me in in the situation where I am now. So it's, it's nothing, something that I even seem to be, <clears throat> I don't even feel I have much of a choice. Uh, because I, I thought about this very often about could I completely give up uh, working at Ableton and just do my art? Um, or should I not engage 100% uh, at Ableton where a lot of really, really bright, cool people doing really interesting things and where it could be so much fun to dedicate all my time? And in both cases, for me, the answer is no, because that's not me. And I can be useful at Ableton because I spend so much time outside the company. And I can make my art, uh, even if it costs more money than it gets, uh, because I have other means to create income. 
Uh, so th these things are kind of interconnected and also inspire each other. I mean, the stuff I learn as far as structural thinking is concerned when I'm at Ableton, the, dis the discussions I have there, they help me when it comes to solve artistic problems also. So in, in a way, it, it seems to be all at the end, just one thing. Uh, yeah, I guess this is how I balance it. That makes and it's difficult. It's, it's, it's definitely difficult. Um, but I just don't see another alternative than trying to balance them somehow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf. Okay, and finally from Manoli, um, who asks, as, as educators, how can we instill confidence to our students that anyone can make art by, by, technology, by the technology and resources available nowadays? Or is this not a good way to go about this? I think I think everyone who who feels creative um, should be encouraged to try um, try themselves out and try to find ways to turn their crea creativity into something that that works for them. Uh, <clears throat> so I would always uh, be in favor for artistic expression. Uh, also, if potentially even if I think of it from a from a career perspective, from a very economically driven um, perspective, because at the end of the day, if you are creative and if you allow your creative thinking to be part of your life, you um, you have the tools on hand that are also useful for solving creative tasks in whatever other situation you have in. Because the <clears throat> being an artist or exploring your creati creativity means um, thinking out of the box, means thinking independently, means uh, being open to learn new things. So for me, it's just a question of how do you connotate the desire to to become uh, artistic. And um, if I were still teaching, I would probably make sure my students understand that there is a quality in artistic expression that they can also tell um, the human resources person at a bank. Say, well, you can stay, you can forever stick to a status quo and do things uh, like they have been done the last 500 years. But if you want to do something towards the future, you need people who, at least to a certain degree, <clears throat> can rethink their, their current practice and come up with a future practice. And that's something where artistic thinking comes into uh, the game. So, um, yeah, um, everyone should try to be as creative as possible because society is restrictive enough and everything we can do to um, find our own expression is great. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, I hope that's answered your question, Manali. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, for those fantastic questions. Thank you to our student Q&A team um, for doing a brilliant job. And thank you so much, Robert, um, for a fantastic lecture and a really, really engaging Q&A session. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, and my course as ever so we will see you um, all next week for echo at home um lecture the second one second last one of the term so thanks so much robert um robert. Well, thank, thank you for the invitation it was great fun um <laughs> and um good comments coming in <laughs> Okay. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, I'll I'll shoot you an email um, and tidy up um, the rest of the stuff. Hey, and thank you. Know, one, one, one day I might come actually to London and we can meet again in person. So that would be nice. um, I, I, I say goodbye to everyone too and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And and. Um, <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thanks, Robert. So, thank you all. Bye. Take care. Bye.